Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks for um, having me here. And my name is Avi Srivastava. And let me start with my introduction for a bit. Uh, I'm a postdoc uh, in uh, New York Genome Center. And I work with Rahul Satija. And I did my PhD uh, in computer science from Stony Brook, uh, where, I, uh, where I work in quantification and uh, bulk RNA-seq and single-seq RNA-seq. So this talk is con gonna mostly concentrate around my thesis and how we, we came up with different ideas, how we can improve them, uh, specifically for single cell RNA-seq. And uh, hopefully uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll get more interesting <laughs> as we keep going along. So, let's me, let me start with this uh, brief uh, introduction. Like, uh, with each day, every day, we are generating terabytes of data, and there's lots and lots of new data is coming out. And the beautiful part of this new data, which is coming out, is usually how, how much resolution we can generate from them, and, they are, and also they getting generated with very high throughput. So one important aspect of this is that we are trying to measure many different types of assays. And obviously you have different protocols, different methods, different tools, then you need actually different kind of methods which can be designed and tweaked to, um, uh, to measure what you're trying to uh, uh, do analysis using your assay. So over the last decade or so, uh, there's been lots of, lots of studies based on different type of assays they are trying to measure different things in many different ways so something around the 2006 or 7 uh, rna seq study came along and from that time it it just have blown up like uh, apart uh, it, it's been exploded a lot and there are lots and lots of research which are the, which is done on rna seq okay and it kind of become a very important factor in doing uh, analysis downstream and even in rna seq <laughs> so there are a bunch of uh, uh, as uh, as time come along with the introduction of single cell RNA seq, there are a bunch of single cell protocol which came along. They have different caveats of their own, and uh, they try to measure uh, specifically RNA seq, but it, to, through different ways, which we're going to talk about in the coming slides. But you can uh, you can start to appreciate that there are so many methods, so many different kind of measurement. You need different uh, tools and uh, methods to analyze them. So there was a beautiful study by Paul Moore et al. And, and they were, then they were trying to say that as you generate, uh, keep on generating a data, the, the real cost of an experiment is also weighed down to how much, ta how much uh, money you spend on analyzing it. And it's not just the new data, which is a problem. The data which is already present, it's a huge amount of data and you need to figure out methods actually to, do, to work around those things which can be done efficiently and, and uh, gives you some discoveries which you are looking for at the first place when you design your experiments. So these are some of the most basic motivations of why we, we need actually uh, faster efficient methods to analyze the data. So specifically in RNA-seq, uh, if we talk about there's lots of studies which concentrate, uh, uh, concentrate around uh, getting the expression and quantification. We talk a lot uh, in terms of quantification, but what they try to do is actually what you are interested in, like just to give you a brief example, like what genes or transcripts are turned on and off, right? And at what level they are expressed, are they differentially expressed if, if you provide a couple of experiments, one with, with and another without an environment or stimuli or uh, any kind of additional factor. So uh, just to give you a brief summary, if, if you assume there's a DNA with a genome, obviously, it gets transcript, uh, transcript, transcribed into an RNA and that get alternately spliced into multiple isoforms. So what we do is we take these small mRNAs or multi, uh, mature, mature RNAs and we chop them into multiple small pieces. And these are generally called as uh, reads. So when I say quantification, what I mean is if you have given a, given a reference, reference can be transcriptome, which is a set of transcripts or a set of genomes. Okay, you have given either of these two things. Also, you, based on your experiment, you have a set of reads. And what you have to do is you have to take these two things and figure out what is the frequency or what is the count which you expect of considering this set of reads, uh, which can be assigned for each of the reference sequence in the transcriptome or the genome. 
So here, let's say there was three transcripts and there was some set of reads. Here I'm trying to show that the first two were having one count and the third one was not expressed at all. So this is kind of what I mean, like uh, you have to quantify the set of reads into some uh, bins which were defined based on uh, previously defined, uh, previously known reference sequence, which can be transcript from all the genes. Uh, and when we uh, when we talk about these RNA seq studies, they they basically over the time has fallen into two different regimes: bulk RNA seq and single cell RNA seq. Okay. So when I talk about uh, so there's a very beautiful analogy which came out from the Twitter, and this is uh, how it it's tried to post is that if you look at bulk RNA seq, it's kind of like a smoothie. It mixes everything, blends everything up. Uh, but if you talk about uh, a single cell energy, you want to study each and different fruits separately or disjointly. So just to summarize, if, if you take a tissue, you try to bunch, uh, sequence everything together. But even in single cell, you try to isolate each and every cell and then try to sequence them and uh, study them downstream. So you can imagine they both of them have their own caveats and pros and cons. So in bulk RNA-seq, we have typically millions or tens of millions of cells. And you can imagine if you have so much, so many observations, you have high, uh, let's say, confidence and high fidelity in your, in your uh, downstream analysis. And what they try to measure is a transcript level abundances at the population level, which is at the tissue level. And when I talk about single cell, uh, we typically talk, talk about tens of thousands. This gets so single cell is really awesome that studies uh, they have this slide is already outdated now even you can study like combinatorial uh, with combinatorial indexing like millions of cells within one experiment so this should be updated but in general you can study tens of thousands of cells what uh, usually is is there is a low coverage that is if you talk about uh, droplet based sequencing the reads per cell coverage is relatively low. And what they try to measure is the gene level. Remember, they, here we try to study is the transcript level. Since the sparsity and the reads per cell level coverage is too low, we try to study at the uh, gene level. And but with each cell, what are the gene level abundances? And uh, it kind of divides based on that. And then we try to analyze uh, downstream. So for this talk, we are mainly concentrated uh, concentrated on the single cell RNA. Now, uh, when we talk about single cell RNA seq, there are a bunch of different ways you can you can uh, measure uh, perform a single cell exp uh, single cell uh, gene expression study. So, just to give you a very brief overview, uh, if you start with the solid tissue, you deassociate them into single cell, you isolate the cell. This this is a very important part, the cell isolation part, and they sorry they generally part uh, like uh, they generally get uh, I, cells. You generally get isolated in mainly three big regimes. One was micro well, where you need human pipetting and then uh, the throughput is very, very low. Then there was microfluidic, which is like a, a automated pipeline. We, it's integrated system. But again, uh, the throughput is still low, although the, th uh, the step is, uh, uh, let's say, integrated. But then there was recent th drop rate based technologies which came along, I think it's 2015 or 2016, with Makosko and uh, Alan Klein. They introduced this drop seek based uh, cell isolation techniques where they use microfluidic chips. And the beautiful part of these uh, uh, droplet based sequencing is you can isolate at what much more, uh, much more higher rate, but the throughput is very, very high. Okay. And once you have the single cell isolation, you lyse the cell, you extract RNA, then you reverse transcribe, reverse transcribe it to generate this complementary DNA, you amplify it. So this step is important because the amount of cDNA which you get from single cell analysis is way, way too small. So you perform an amplification step, you perform sequencing, and then you try to perform uh, generate a single cell profile. So this is where we generally lie in this talk and how we can generate from sequencing data to generate a single cell expression profile. And then down the line uh, to tomorrow and day after, uh, Shale is going to talk about uh, using them downstream, uh, and uh, we can we can uh, discuss more once we get to that stage. But for this talk, we're not going to concentrate mostly on the droplet-based sequencing methods. Now, so just to give you a brief overview of uh, droplet-based sequencing methods, so what they have is there's a microfluidic chip. Okay, they have multiple uh, insertion points in these chips. From one side, you insert a uh, gel bait emulsions. And from the two other side, you insert one from one uh, cells and the second side, you insert an oil. What happens is it actually captures in a droplet, the cell bead and the cell, okay? 
and what happens is you take them uh, you uh, isolate or uh, you take the single cell in a in a in, in the in tenex word they are usually called as gems and you tag them with cellular barcode and humi so when i say cellular barcode what it really means is is kind of id okay which can separate uh, a sequencing uh, sequencing read from this cell to this cell so you can imagine the color in these different droplets represent a cellular barcode since they are uniquely identifiable here they have the same color but uh, we'll talk about how that can be uh, worked around and then what are the umis so umis are unique molecular identifier when we actually kind of zoomed in once we go within this cell they can be multiple molecules within this cell so how do you separate the molecules within a cell that's how uh, this umi comes into the scene and we can separate them apart in silico so this is how the tagging is usually done in droplet based world you take these sequence you prepare the library amplify and sequence them so this is just a very big idea uh, how the sequencing is performed okay now coming to more on the computational side so in theory like uh, we talked uh, let's say let's give me a brief overview of this too so in uh, what what a sequencing experiment generates it's a pair of fastq files okay so the first end of the fastq file would be cellular barcode and the umi and the second end would be generally a sequence which is a mature rna sequence so what you do is you have been given a bunch of a set of reads like all of them will be generated through a fastq file first you do is you align to the reference and group them so what what would do i mean by grouping so you look at these let's say 16 bases initially which represent cellular barcode you group them and each group might represent a cell a cell uh, where these reads are coming from okay so they here i'm trying to show with like four cells a different kind of uh, cellular barcodes are separating them in silico okay and the second level of grouping which is performed within a cell to separate this read from this read from this read so that we can assign uh, to each of the genes which this uh, this read is coming from this is how the umi comes into the scene and at the end of the day you perform deduplication remember since the, there was a amount of material was so sparse you have to amplify it so what you have to do you have to perform deduplication which we going to talk a lot on the coming slides and at the end of the day you generate gene versus cell count matrix and this is this is like the lingua franca of a lot of uh, downstream analysis which try to which we try to do like clustering uh, pseudo time rna velocity and all those things so they take these things uh, these matrices gene versus cell count matrices as an input and uh, if you if you assume like if you look at the workflow it looks like very simple and i i literally can be done in pandas in like in python in like let's say 10 lines of code okay but in practice uh, this can get very very complicated and uh, let me let me start with what why and why what are the problems which can occur when you talk uh, in these experiments right so uh, let's start with this uh, this small uh, one pre pcr molecule so what happens is uh, what i'm trying to show here is with this blue square i'm trying to show an a umi sequence and this tilde kind of uh, lagging sequence we am trying to show is it's actually uh, coming from a mature rna okay so once we have this uh, uh, molecules what we do is we perform pcr right and each of them will get copied into two and there's a like a tree which comes along and you'll have bunch of uh, uh, amplified sequences from one this from one pre pcr molecule okay and down the line when you're performing the pcr uh, let's assume there was one sequencing uh, error which happened uh, through the second round of pcr right and from this if you keep on copying down the line from this uh, molecule you'll end up this group of uh, molecules which all of them have this one error similarly this red error happens a bit upstream and it had all of the copies will have this error so you remember we talk i was talking about we once we have this all those observation you have to deduplicate them the idea of deduplicating is like you have performed amplification and you you have these set of uh, reads uh, or observation and you have to predict how many pre pcr molecules were initially present in the experiment so what is the basic idea is you take all the blue things which are uh, in this uh, pre uh, in this uh, amplified sequence and you group them and say there was The, and you, you deduplicate them and say this represent one pcr pre pre pcr molecule so imagine everything was right everything was blue you will consider them as one group and you will say one molecule was present but 
here we have this problem like these group of uh, uh, ids were different from these group of ids and if you try to deduplicate them you will end up saying there are three molecules and in actual reality there was only one molecule so this is one of the way there uh, you can inflate or sometimes deflate your actually actual the true count present which is uh, true count which is present in your experiment so experiment so so it's not just uh, the uh, it's not just the pcr sequencing error which is the problem uh, imagine the following scenario right uh, let's look at the top uh, uh, box so there's group of humans which all map to gene a okay and then now i ask you deduplicate them what you will do is you will say huh they are all looking same and let's let's uh, deduplicate them and assign one count to gene a that's fine let's look at the middle one so there was one group of cell there was one error you say that oh, lots of reads are mapping to gene a but this is one off situation and this is one base so there was one sequencing error what you will do let's let's assign this to let's allow one error in your sequencing and you can still you know assign one counts to gene a okay then even then you can work out but the real problem comes in when there's multi map okay so let's assume there is a group of reads which equally mapped which maps equally good to two genes gene a and gene b all right now if you group them together let's say you can say if you allow one error there's there's one molecule which is present which gene are you going to increment it to that's a problem let's assume let's say a different problem let's say you assign two of them to gene a two of them to gene b then you will even though if they are coming from one pcr pre pcr molecule you will say uh, they, since there was two in this gene a you will group them together and assign one count to gene a and group them group the reads in gene b together and assign one counts to gene b and you will end up predicting two counts when there was actually one count so the things are not mutually ex things are actually mutually exclusive when you assign them to and how you assign can matter how you deduplicate so this can explode combinatorially if you assume there are bunch of millions and millions of reads which are equally mapped into multiple genes so uh and this becomes important uh, a lot uh, in terms of your experiment so this is just an observation on open data sets which are out uh, from tenex genomics and we study on five data set pbmc new mouse neurons and we were just try to figure out like how many reads of of the experiment which you are paying big bucks on are actually uh, this multi mapping and it turns out the fraction can be uh, like quite large from 14% to 23% okay and basically what the current tools almost almost every tool which is out there they just toss it away and basically you are throwing away a significant portion of your data to generate a count matrix which which you already have and you can utilize it right and this is one of the problem which we try to solve in in, in our method uh, which we're going to talk downstream so just to summarize what we talked here so there's multiple challenges when you talk about single cell and the quantification and what we basically say that one humai is not equal to one pre pcr molecule so you have to group a bunch of humai and deduplicate them to figure out the pre pcr molecule so that's the deduplication process and another thing which we uh, discuss is one cellular barcode is not equal to one cell they can be two cell the barcode with the same id and you have to the separate them apart which is usually called as a doublet and you have to process them downstream and the third thing which is important dropout but it gets a little controversial over the time so i'm not going to discuss the discuss of, about this a lot but bias is important so you can imagine uh, in these kind of situation how you assign gene a or gene b and what are the kind of scenario where you if you ignore consistently a set of reads which are multi mapping these genes are going to be the counts are going to be super deflated and if if your experiment is important uh, is dependent on these kind of genes which can have multi mapping reads you will have no counts at all because methods are just dropping them away so these these are important in how it can create bias we're going to discuss uh, in the coming slide and the last is the u my collision and you can imagine that uh, if the even if they are coming from two different pre pcr molecule they can have same u my and this is u my collision but it's relatively rare as the length of the u my sequence is 10 to 12 and the probability decreases significantly if you reach to 12 so 
with 10x version 3 chemistry, it's reaching to 12 lengths U mile, and uh, the rare cases are relatively uh, less probable. So we, we kind of ignore this uh, for this talk. So let's see if we have any questions. Uh, Michael, did we have any questions or should I move on? So far, I didn't see any raised hands. All right. Uh, okay, so we we work we try to we discuss all the, we have discussed all these problems and we try to come up with a solution which is called alvin okay uh, which is a dsa dsa and a seek because <laughs> we just came up with this d in here but it's a droplet based single cell rna seq quantification and uh, it, it's designed for let's say 10 10x chromium uh, in drop and all the technologies which are building up upon them like site seek and snare seek which try to measure 8x seek and protein sequence. So these are all family of, uh, let's say, sequencing protocol, which Elvin can take care of. So what does Elvin do? Uh, if you have given a cell population and you have been assigned a set of, you will generate a sequencing experiment. Okay. And the, it, it goes through a bunch of uh, steps to generate a cell versus gene count matrix. Remember the thing which we are interested, if you have given a fast Q read, you want just the cell versus gene count matrix. But with le less bias and with less dropping and considering a principled framework, okay? So what it involves multiple steps, just to give you a brief overview. So what we do is we first group them based on cellular barcodes, right? That was relatively simple. You take the cellular barcodes, which uh, here I'm denoting by this circle. And if there's a yellow bin, you assign it to this bin, red, green, and you try to separate them and you can figure out uh, how to how to process each cell disjointly okay from here on we process each cell each cell and group of reads disjointly we perform some uh, correction but uh, that's relatively trivial we look for one at a distance we try to correct the important steps comes in when we take these sequence and we have to map them so it's very important step we are going to talk about what are the different kind of uh, alignment which can happen once we do this alignment, we perform this UMI deduplication. Uh, we're gonna give, get into much more detail when, what I mean when I talk about UMI deduplication. And once we perform UMI deduplication, we generate a cell versus gene count matrix, and then we can process them downstream to whitelist a cell. When I say whitelist, I, I was mentioning like uh, initially when we say drop uh, doublets, right? Each cellular bar code can have two cells. So we can figure out a way how to separate them apart once we have this cell versus gene count. So we talked about this mapping, right? So let's let's formally define what I mean when I say mapping or alignment. Uh, this is generally, I'm posing it as a read alignment problem. So as we talked initially, we have given a set of reads. Here I'm denoting that set of reads with capital R. Uh, and each read R sub I can have different lengths. So it is not very important for our use case or the definition here, okay? And also we have been given a reference sequence. So a reference sequence can be a transcriptome, it can be a genome. And what once we have given these two things, what we have to figure out for each read, what are the possible locations in the transcriptome or the reference sequence where each, each, read, each of the reads can map equally well and within some bound. And this bound is called added distance bound. Uh, it, it's basically how much far apart, uh, how much, how much uh, error you want to allow when you're mapping this read to the reference sequence. Okay, so this eta is noting that bound. So this is how you pose generally a read alignment problem. So there's a two major regimes uh, where you can perform these read alignment. Okay, so one is based on the genome, the second is based on the transcriptome. So when I talk about genome mapping, basically you have given this big reference genome and you can map to intergenic, uh, uh, intronic, exonic, and splice alignment. When I say splice, I mean, since exons are separated apart, you have to perform alignment considering that this, the read can jump here to here, right? Because the reads are generated from the transcriptome but you perform alignment on the genome. So there are, two, there are a bunch of tools which are out there, but uh, lots, uh, the mo most frequent used one are STAR and HiSET. Uh, then there, uh, you actually map to a hu full genome and for human it can uh, get as big as three gigs. And the issue, uh, and the, 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 both of them have their pros and, pros and cons, but if you, if you map to a genome, the rate of multi-mapping. So when I say a multi-mapping, 
is what I mean is how many location a single read can map to. So if you map to a genome, the rate of multi mapping is relatively less. Usually the a read can map uh, equally good, very well to one or two locations. And this typically, if you talk about use cases, one of the use cases is, is to identify uh, new transcripts. And for let's say uh, non-model organism, you have to figure out what is the transcript. So for let's say model organism, model, model organisms like human mouse, which where we know the transcriptome relatively well. Okay, so we kind of relax a problem, and at the same time, it's difficult in different ways. Okay, and that's what transcriptome mapping tools try to uh, 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 work on. So the tools like Bowtie, AdAppMap, and Selective Alignments, and they actually map to transcriptome, which is for human, it's like 300 megabytes. It it looks looks like that the problem is easier, but it's it, it gets complicated because assume uh, if a read is coming from this exon, right? It will equally map, it will map equally good to all the things, all these three isoforms, right? And the number of multi-mapping, so, and let me pose as a number, like 80 to 90% of the reads actually multi-map because a read can come equally good to multiple exons. And that complicates the problem of mapping because you have to figure out equally good and lots of variation and where it can map. And that's a kind of problem uh, which is a, which we try to resolve it through quantification, and that's what the typical use case involves. So even in this transcriptome mapping world, there's a bifurcation, and you can try to relax a problem. So uh, we we have been generating uh, reads in like billions now, and we have to perform read alignment as fast as possible possible without uh, losing the accuracy. So we kind of relax a problem, and these that's how you separate a, uh, separate the two uh, kind of mapping, uh, how you map a read. So one is read alignment, which we proposed initially, and I kind of missed one thing was as when we pro when we have to find out like which read is mapping to which location, we have to also figure out a cigar string. What is a cigar string? Cigar string is how what is the process which these reads can be converted into this. Uh, reference sequence, right? And that complicates the whole process a lot. So if you relax that assumption that you don't need a cigar string, you just need which read is mapping to which location, that's actually called read mapping problem. And which is different from read alignment problem, which needs a cigar string and how many steps you need. Like you have to change this base, you have to change this base to actually map to this reference sequence. So this is actually the difference between read alignment and the read mapping strategies. So what is, what, why do we need uh, this relaxation, relaxation in the problem? And the answer is speed. And if you, if you try to compare uh, the three different uh, tools, let's say Bowtie, Star, and RapMap, and here we are, I'm trying to show with like 75 million reads, which are 76 base pair, and you try to map them using three different tools, you will look at the how much time it takes to really map them. So with 10 threads, Bowtie was taking some out around 420 minutes. And star was taking relatively less with trend, but uh, but if you keep uh, going uh, with lesser number of threads, which is four usually for current laptops and uh, laptop standards, it star takes 40 minutes. And uh, rap map can do it in like, which is basically read mapping, which solves a read mapping problem. Uh, it can do in minutes. So this is why uh, it it can become super important. Just to put a note here that you are trading something when you're going from here to here, right? And, and that we're going to talk next uh, in the coming slides, what you are trading and why is it important. But if you, this, let, let me give you a brief phylogeny and the, like one slide rundown of what we discussed here. So alignment and mapping base or mapping of a, a mapping can be on the DNA sequence or the RNA sequence. We talked about RNA sequencing and within RNA sequence, there can be genome mapping or the transcriptome mapping in genome. We can be, perform splice alignment and typically involved mapping to genome, top head, star, high set are the tools which you can, you can use. For transcriptome mapping, we have a very high multi-mapping rate. It maps to transcriptome. Tools are Bowtie, BWAM, and, and uh, RapMap, uh, and selective alignment. Within this transcriptome mapping, there's a bifurcation where you perform base-to-base -base alignment using the cigar string. And if you don't need the cigar string, which you just need to map, you use RapMap, and, and that's how you separate a liner with a mapper. And you can assume that is it possible to have as fast speed as mapper, but as good accuracy of, of alignment at transcriptome. And that's what our re recent paper, which we tried to discuss, which is called selective alignment. You're not performing 
uh, alignment for every read. You can imagine there, there should be a, a, a significant fraction of reads which doesn't need like all those um, fancy mapping or they're mapping exactly to the reference transcriptome. So you don't map everything for uh, in this selective alignment. As the name suggests, you select the reads which you have to align and you align only those. So the benefit of this is you get as close as the speed as to the mapper, but as good as an accuracy of a mapping close to the uh, regular like bowtie 2 and BWA type of method. So this is the selective alignment method. You can check out this paper if you're interested. But this was just the whole overview of, uh, of the how alignment and uh, alignment and strat uh, alignment strategies try to separate apart. Okay, let me break uh, here. Uh, Michael, is there any question? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, how, how does this uh, uh, form of alignment compare to pseudo aligners like Callisto? Right. So pseudo aligners and, and wrap map are in the similar kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, regime. So they are actually mappers. Wrap map, quasi alignment, pseudo alignment, they are in the same category. They are called generally lightweight mapping techniques and they do not calculate cigar swings. So this is how, this is where um, uh, pseudo alignment will, is going to fall. I should have mentioned it here. My apologies. I, I, kind of forget that. But that, is that answer to the question? Uh, yeah, partially. Uh, I was also wondering, I mean, basically, uh, Callisto is, is supposed to be like really fast, right? I mean, how yeah. does it compare in speed? Speed, uh, it, it is as fast as wrap map and all the lightweight mapping method, but accuracy, it is not. And that's what we discussed discuss in detail in this paper, because you can imagine, like I was talking, when you, when you do a lot fast, uh, when you do try to map things very very fast you have to trade off something and it kind of trails or some of the uh, complicated cases where you need an actual end-to-end -end alignment which cannot be uh, done by just performing a mapping so speed yes it is very uh, as accurate as as fast as wrap map and other lightweight technique but with accuracy it's not actually does it make sense there is another question from Sebastian. Yes, I, I wonder about um, the three prime bias. So you don't um, have reads from the whole transcript, but only from one end. And uh, what consequences um, does this have? Um, is it an easier because you see less and uh, you maybe get more unique counts, at least on the gene level? Right. That's a very, uh, very good question. So. Uh, we're going to cover a lot in our exercises about three prime and all those things. But to answer your question briefly, uh, yes, all the single cell technology, let's not say all, most of the single cell technologies are using one end, right? And it, this basically, even though we have the second end, which, which is basically cellular barcode and BOMI, there's no actual mappable sequence. Okay. So what you end up with is one sequence. And if you have one sequence, it's, it's harder to align. Okay, you can imagine the following scenario. If a read gets, if you have a paired end reads and if it maps to two different locations, you can assume, you can take this uh, fragment length, which is distance between two end of, a, end of a fragment, end of a read and figure out a model, like let's say one location was mapping the reads way too far apart. And the second location, read was mapping in relatively uh, similar kind of fragment length, right? So you can you can make a decision based on this uh, two regimes, like be using the fragment length. But in single end, single end and single cell word, there's only one end. It makes the mapping and decision problem harder to answer your question briefly, yes. But uh, the map multi-mapping cases are still there and that's what we try to resolve using expectation maximization algorithms. We're gonna talk a little bit uh, in the coming slides uh, uh, down, uh, as, we come, as, the, as we talk about QMI deduplication and resolution. Thanks. Okay, thanks, thanks for your question, Kat. Uh, we, we have talked a bit about alignment strategies uh, till here. Let's uh, take at the, another important aspect which we initially uh, talked about is the UMI deduplication. So uh, let's go back to our example which we talked initially. We have cellular barcode UMI transfer sequence. We align them and group them, and we have to perform the UMI deduplication. So we have some idea how to reach here, but how to reach go from here to here, uh, we're gonna talk next. So over the time, 
there are a bunch of tools which have come, which which came out, which perform uh, this DSR and seq quantification. Uh, Cell Ranger is is out from 2017, and it, it, it's per, uh, it, it's pretty well known, and it's run by default if you are if you are ex performing experiment on 10 x genomics data set. But under the hood, it uses star as an aligner. And in 2017, uh, there was one other tool, which is called UMI Tools, which came out and under the hood, hood uh, sorry, under the hood, it also uses star aligner. In 2018, we pro proposed Elvin, uh, which uses Salmon's quasi mapping. And now it started to use selective alignment, which is much uh, sensitive and much accurate, or much more accurate to uh, perform alignment. Then Star Solo came out recently, which uses Star Alignment, and then there's Hera T, which came out it's from. Uh, it's an awesome tool. It came. It, it's from a, a company called BioTuring. Uh, they have performed multiple benchmarks, but in, in under the hood, they have their own aligners called Hera. And at last, there was a bus tool which came out. It uses Callisto-based pseudo alignment uh, alignment strategies. So, just to note one point, none of the tools other than UMI tools and uh, Elvin are published anywhere. And for Cell Ranger, there's barely anything known uh, in terms of method, what is doing, uh, what they are trying to do uh, in under the under their uh, algorithmic part. There's some gist on their website. From my understanding is basically uh, through reading their code, uh, uh, but uh, I'll try to summarize whatever they're trying to do. And one very important point to note here that no, no other tool except Elvin uh, is trying to resolve multi-mapping rate. Okay, and there is no principal framework to use them, and every tool is tossing them away. And we're going to talk about like why is it important, and how can it bias your analysis towards a group of genes. Uh, if if your uh, if your interest of gene is not in them, you will end up having no counts at all. So we will we'll talk about why it can be important. But this is just giving you a gist of what uh, different kind of strategies are there. This is not an exhaustive there. There's Zoomy, I think, tool. There are a couple of other tools which under the hood try to use Star Aligner and they try to replicate Cell Ranger. But this gives you a basic rundown of all the quantification methods. So let me propose this UMI deduplication problem and we try to go along uh, how different methods uh, are trying to use them. Okay. So for each cell, uh, what, what you have been given, uh, you have been given a, uh, so remember we talked about how each cell has been separated out. So before performing you do, you might duplication, you have to segregate a uh, group of reads into multiple bins and each bin represent one cell or cellular bar. So what you've been given, you have given these separated uh, bins and within each bin, you have given a set of U mice with their frequencies and their mapping. Remember this you might deduplication happens after mapping. Just to repeat, for each bin, you have given a set of U mice their frequencies and their mapping location. And basically what you have to figure out, deduplicate them and give me what is the number of pre-PCR, that is before performing the P, uh, PCR cycle, how many molecules were actually present in an experiment. So Yumi tools come with, uh, Yumi tool came up with their directional approach. Uh, let me give you a gist of what they're trying to show here. Each circle represent a UMI and the sequence, it usually a longer sequence, but this is an toy example. This is uh, showing an, um, a sequence of a UMI. So you start with the highest frequency UMI within one cell we're talking, and you look for what are the one nearest neighbor of this UMI. So here, since only T is changed from this sequence, this is one nearest neighbor. C is changed, this is one nearest neighbor. A is changed, this is one nearest neighbor, okay? And you connect them using this uh, arrows. Uh, this is also you my this is also with the and the number in the middle is just giving the frequency of uh, this you my frequency of this you my frequency of this you my and the gene g1 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 here i mean what is the gene it's this set of you my is actually mapping so just to summarize this you my has the sequence acgt all of the reads were mapping to gene g1 and there are 456 reads such uh, as uh, like this within one cell. Similarly for other circuits. So once you connect this one added distance, now you try to extend further recursively. You look for one added distance from this ACAT and you figure out, you know, there's only G is changing here and you connect them together. Now you can ask like, why are you not connecting these two? Let's say ACAT, there's only a difference of A and C here. 
So that's how they propose a, uh, another, uh, let's say, constraint is when you're connecting higher frequency, when you're connecting uh, the, this, uh, these UMIs or the circles, the one with the higher frequency, uh, which is coming from the highest one, has to be less than half, which is uh, with where you're connecting from. So here, since 72 was less than half, like which is 200 something, you're gonna connect this. 72 has uh, in connection these two, uh, let's say UMIs, but only this one was less than half. So we connect this, and this was for much more than less than half. We are not gonna connect this. So once we have this network, then the basically the task is to perform connective components. So what is connective component? You figure out all the circles which were connected through this network, and you will say, you know, these all represent one molecule and this represent a second molecule. So this is how the UMI deduplication is performed in UMI tools. So there, there is a question, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, there is a question um, about, is there a minimum UMI length for UMI deduplication? And uh, it's based on what you're showing here. Probably it wouldn't work for four or just six base pair length UMIs. So I'm assuming uh, you're talking about edit distance, how far they can be? I, I didn't quite understand that question. No, the, the length okay. of the UMI, which is four base pairs here, what is the minimum length that this makes sense? Right, so currently uh, there's a beautiful paper, it's called Drop EST, and the typical length which they claim, if you, so why is it important, just to give me a, a little uh, rundown, like you can assume uh, they was, these were two pre-PCR molecules, they can still have the same UMI sequence. Okay, and this is called UMI collision. And let's say, assume that what is the probability of them? That's probability is relatively less. Based on the evidence, if you take a UMI sequence, which is long enough, and the long enough uh, criteria is usually around 10, 10 length sequences. But as we keep on doing deeper and deeper sequencing, even 10 is not enough. So that's why in their latest, uh, let's say, uh, latest chemistry, 10x V3, they try to uh, use like 12 length UMI sequence. But this is a toy example, that's why I'm using. They are using in the paper as four. So 10 to 12, I would say the probability is very, the probability that you will have collision is relatively very low and you can avoid uh, the errors which can be due to that. Does it make sense? I'm assuming it does. <laughs> yep, thank you. Okay. So this is the UMI tool strategy, strategy and they try to deduplicate. Now imagine the following scenario. I was talking about uh, your gene multimapping and why it can be important, what can it create? Uh, assume the following thing. This, the connective, uh, there was another read, uh, there was this UMI with 72 counts. Let's assume instead of mapping just to G1, it maps to G1 and G2, okay? And what will happen, you will just, toss it away. So all the reads coming from here will be just tossed away. So what will happen? So what will happen is if you toss away the multi-mapping reads, the network will break. The network will break. And if the network, network will break, you will end up predicting inflated counts. And what, in this specific scenario, you will there will be no connection from this to this since this is more than one added distance away from this. And you will, you will group these things together as one, these things together as second, and this thing together as third. So you'll end up saying there were three pre-PCR molecules. Okay, so this is one of the way it can mess up. There can be multiple kind of scenarios which we, which we can discuss offline, but this is one of the way how you can mess up your uh, counts. So this is just a gif, gist of Yumi tools uh, directional approach. So if you talk about cell ranger, uh, again, uh, this is very brief uh, because it's understanding of the code, but what they try to do is actually reverse the whole situation. So what we have done here, we are assigning a UMI to a gene. What they do, we assign gene to a UMI, okay? So within one cell, again, we are talking uh, after binning and after mapping. Let's assume we have a frequency of this ACAG, which was assigned G1. And then there's a frequency of, then there was a frequency of another, uh, uh, the, the same UMI with, with mapping to another gene with frequency nine. So what they do, you, they look, you look all the genes which this UMI can come from within one cell and assign it to the highest frequency one. So this is how they try to, you might deduplicate uh, their uh, UMI count. But 
imagine the following scenario again multi mapping so if there is a bunch of g, uh, bunch of uh, reads which are mapping equally well to g, gene 2 and gene 3 which is a separate gene and there were eight counts in them so let's uh, and basically you toss them away now let's assume if you can if you were let's say through some algorithm assign all these counts to g2 so the overall counts of g2 will become 8 plus 8 16 17 right and using just their algorithm like 17 counts you'll end up assigning it to g2 right but instead you assign it to g1 so this is again one of the examples like why cell ranger counts can get uh, deflated uh, when we talk this is not just an example of deflation but different from what is expected and if you take this highest frequency based approach it can mess things up then there was pseudo alignment uh, i didn't add a slide but but there's pseudo alignment based strategies where you can look at all the uh, groups of things and you assign everything to one gene okay and you let's say you look for gene one and look for the group of uh, u mice you deduplicate them and you assign to g1 so this is one of the ways you try to uh, assign a deduplicate a u mice again if you have a multi mapping read you end up tossing it away and you don't have any idea of uh, how to resolve it so Bobby, there is another question sure um sebastian do you like to ask yourself No, that's not a question from my side. Oh, okay. You you raised your hand. Oh, S sorry, Avi, for the intro. Yeah, yeah, no problem. It's good. I like uh, the session is interactive. <clears throat> so, uh, to give you how we try to solve problem, we kind of reformulated a problem a bit. Okay, and how we formulate it's important. Uh, we use actually a graph based approach, similar to uh, Yumi tools. But for defining graph-based approach, let's formally define what is graph. And graph is component of vertices and edges. Okay. So first we have to define vertex. So vertex is a tuple of two things. The first thing is the equivalence class. What is the equivalence class? A set of transcript that specific reads map to. Okay. So this is what is called as equivalence class. And the second component of the tuple is the UI sequence. So, which is actually the nucleotide sequences. And if you combine these together, that will uh, create a vertex. So with, the, with each vertex, just like Yumi tools, we have a frequency, which is given by C of V, and it'll give you the frequency of this vertex. So once we have this vertices, we try to connect those vertices through edges, right? So we define two type of edges, bidirectional and unidirectional edges. It'll get much more clear skipping this part, but I'll go into detail about the equation, but just to look at the cartoon, it'll get much more clearer. Here I'm trying to show with circle, a UMI. With this polygon, I'm trying to show the UMI sequence. So if the polygons are the same, they have the same UMI sequence. If the polygons have different number of edges, it's three here, four here. I'm mean, Here I'm trying to show they are one added distance apart, okay? So one, what do you mean by bi-directional edge? So for bi-directional edge, you observe a group of a UMI, a, a UMI which have the same UMI sequence and it shares at least one transcript within its equivalence class. So let's, uh, let's assume this example, right? We have a UMI sequence which have equivalence class T1, T2. What it means is this UMI maps equally well. You cannot differentiate through mapping that which transcript this UMI is getting mapped to. There's another group of reads for the same UMI, which maps to just T1, okay? And you assign a bidirectional edge means that both of these UMIs can be collapsed into each other. So what is a directional edge? It's, it's similar to the directional notion of UMI tools. If there are two UMIs, one with frequency T1, one with equivalence class T1, another with equivalence class T1, T2, they share at least one transcript. And, but the frequencies are different. So one has five, the second one has 20. And if the, if the lower one is the less than half of the first one, you assign a directional edge, which means that this UMI can be collapsed into this one. So bidirectional can be collapsed into each other. Directional, that one can be collapsed into the second one. So this is how we define edges and vertices. Uh, deep breath here. <laughs> so how we propose uh, our problem uh, solution. So what, what we have given is this UMI resolution graph, which is the set of vertices which we define and set of edges, how we define to connect them. So what we have to find a minimum cardinality cover by monochromatic arborescence. So it's a fancy way of saying we have to group the UMI 
groups together that will represent a pre pcr molecule with considering a parsimony right and it'll get much more clear in the downstream cart cartoon what i mean by uh, a parsimony uh, in this specific scenario so we have proved uh, in computer science we try to prove that the problems are very hard it, it's relatively uh, exponential to solve and we try to throw the show this through the reduction from a already hard problem and we prove that from dominating set but for this talk it's relatively uh, imp not important because the number of things which we try to solve is relatively less complicated than we actually need asymptotically to, to, to compare it as to an np complete problem so this cartoon will make much more sense if you try to if you if once we go through these slides so again this polygon represent u mice and the gray sequence i'm trying to show here as a sequence and this this sequence this set group of reads are coming mapping to two gene two transcript t1 t2 and they both are coming from two disjoint genes g1 and g2 okay and these group of reads are mapping equally well to both g1 g2 t1 t2 and these group of reads are mapping just to t1 okay so we made a network using the frequency i have reduced removed the frequency it's not important because all it needs all we need is this edges so we have this network which we used the previous analogy to design so this uh, umi has this is the here i'm not using the same polygon it should be the same but anyway here i made the network using the umi sequence and the this represent the uh, let's say uh, the equivalence class for this umi this umi is from only t2 and this umi is coming from t1 now what we have to do is we have to group them together considering this multi mapping and uh, figure out what is the pre pcr molecule so there can be multiple ways you can resolve it let's assume we assign this t1 t2 to just to t2 okay and what will happen this t1 t2 t2 will group together like this and t1 will separate apart like that and t1 will separate apart in the bottom one like that so what you will see there are three u my uh, deduplicated uh, three pre, pre pcr molecule right but another solution can be you assign it to t1 and you group all of them together and separate apart this into t2 okay so this will end up predicting two arborescence arborescence is just an analogy to here and an, an, an analogy to pre pcr molecules and we select this as a solution for elvin because we are looking for parsimony as a solution okay and and this is how we try to resolve graph using all the possible combination and resolve it in the as few as possible components but the important question is multi mapping right it is possible that all of the umis in the network are coming from everything is multi mapping then what will you do like uh, these two umis are coming from t1 t2 this is also coming from t1 t2 if they are coming from same gene you will just you know say they are coming from one gene and get rid of it but if they are coming from different genes which gene this after let's say you perform deduplication which gene you you assign this counts to and that's significantly important and we resolve it through expectation maximization algorithm and just to give what and how it works uh, uh, this slide will try to explain that so we first of all try to dissolve or separate the problem into three components okay tier 1 tier 2 and tier 3 so this is kind of how hard a problem is so tier 1 are the easiest problem to solve you replicate everything from g1 everything from g2 and you will say four counts g1 four two counts t2 uh, gene 2 this should be t2 it should not be. but anyways uh, tier 2 right what are the tier 2 kind of problems you have this g the group of u mice which are mapping to g1 g2 and they have three counts and they have, you have one another u mi which has two counts which is mapping to only one gene okay so what you can do is you assign two counts to g2 that's fine and you just divide half and half this three right and assign 1.5 to g1 and 1.5 to uh, g2 right this is one of the way you can assume you try to divide a, a problem which has some unique evidence now the real problem is like when you have no unique evidence at all like single cell data is very very sparse sparse and these problems are very hard to solve right and there is no unique evidence which we try to use so here we can assume that you know there is some evidence that reads are coming from g2 then most probably these reads are also coming from g2 you can assign higher weight to them and that's why it become 3.5 but here there is no way you can just do half 1.5 and 1.5 and we try to do uh, using and we call these as a tier 3 genes uh, tier 3 genes as a hardest problem to solve we have another paper which we try to resolve this uh, using sharing information across cell but that's beyond the scope of this talk
So this is how you define the problem. And EM, uh, EM tries to solve very, very, uh, let's say, in a bird eye view. So let's get to uh, like, why is it important and why should you really bother about this? Okay. So this is really fascinating example. And I really love this uh, example. Uh, it, it just pops out like, why is it important? So what I did was here, let's concentrate on this pin. What I did here was I take the set of all genes and, as, and assign a score, right? For human, uh, assign a score and bin them. So that score, bin one means this is score, this, this set of group of genes got a score less than 0.1, similarly 0 0.2, 0 0.3, something like that. And we group them on the 10 genes. And what is that score? That score is actually gene unique, uniqueness ratio. And what is uniqueness? We actually parse the nucleotide sequence of a gene and figure out how many sequence or the group uh, or the length of the sequence is unique to that specific gene, right? If, I, if the gene uniqueness is one, it means that this set of genes have unique sequence and it's not shared at all in any other gene. So once you have that kind of situation, they cannot be multi-mapping because if the sequence is not shared, there will be no multi-mapping. Every reads will assign to this uh, specific, specifically unique uh, gene. Now, if you go towards left and the numbers keep decreasing. So when I talk about 0.1, what it really means is 90% of the sequence of a gene is actually the same ac across multiple genes, right? And you can imagine our algorithm work will work specifically very, very good or relatively better for these kind of genes where, you know, all other tools where you have multi-mapping, they will toss it away and we will end up considering them and using uh, performing the analysis right so the x axis is basically the gene uniqueness and you will you the, the mental model should be that as we go towards left elvin should perform better than cell ranger or any other tools so what is the y axis here so if you perform umi deduplication uh, you would have some counts post pre uh, post umi deduplication you have some count pre umi deduplication this number is basically that fraction of post versus pre umi deduplication right and if that that ratio should be relatively constant it should not matter on the what gene you are working on so as you see that elvin and cell ranger would have similar kind of uh, this ratio uh, this uh, umi deduplication ratio for the genes which we have high confidence but as we keep on going left cell ranger ratio keep on dropping because it just keeps on dropping the reads. One thing, and that's fascinating, like how Elvin keeps uh, the similar kind of trend across where its goals keep going left. So one thing to note here, the bunch of genes, a significant portion of the genes are on the right hand side of the, of the spectrum, but they are grouped a bunch of cells, a bunch of genes, which are on the left side as well. And if your experiment concentrates on that, then it'll, it'll, it'll be super important that you consider these kind of methods. Uh, this is the last uh, slide, I think, uh, but this talks about why uh, it can, how can we uh, compare this to, let's say, bulk RNA-seq. So what we did was we take a sample from bulk RNA-seq and the same st sample study on the single cell RNA-seq. We combine all the cells together in single cell to reflect a pseudo bulk and compare the correlation between the actual bulk and the pseudo bulk. And you would assume that should not depend on the gene uniqueness ratio. So uh, here we try to compare the correlation, the y-axis, the spm one correlation of each cell. Uh, oh, sorry, it's a pseudo bulk of each experiment. And we show that Elvin, as we keep on going left, left has higher correlation uh, with, the pseudo, uh, with the actual bulk uh, experiment. Uh, there are a bunch of things which are relatively high, uh, difficult to solve, which we try to show here through this tier matrix, right? So remember, we talk about tier one, two, three, tier one being easiest problem. So you will see that tier one are concentrated relatively on the right side and tier three are relatively on the left side where the problems get harder to solve. So this kind of motivates why we should be thinking and working on this uh, type of, type of uh, methods. And last, uh, it's super fast. Uh, it should not be like we initially from talking from the start that efficiency, a computational efficiency is really important. And we compare with cell rangers and human tool, it's like, almost a magnitude, sometimes twice of the magnitude as fast from running cell ranger and uses much less memory uh, than cell ranger. And uh, just to end this, we are working a lot uh, on extending this to multiple as initially I was taught that Elvin can work with all the downstream uh, single cell technologies, which can actually use uh, droplet based technology like combinatorial indexing, 
spatial quantification, uh, RNA-seq velocity, site-seq data, snare-seq data, which use ATAC-seq, RNA-seq together. So there's a multimodal information coming, uh, uh, technologies are coming out. Elvin can work on that. And we're working extensively to write tutorials uh, to help people out how to run. Uh, I hope uh, it, it was useful and I'm open to questions if you guys have any.